The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice from heaven said, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. So the other evening, Maddie and I were cuddled up on my bed watching Frozen 2 for about the 564th time when Maddie turned to me and said, is that true? Now I've seen Frozen 2 about 400 of those 564 times, so I hadn't really been paying close attention and I was mostly allowing social media to entertain me. So I wasn't quite sure what she was asking me to verify. What, babe, is what true? Can turtles breathe through their butts? Momentary pause of bewilderment while I re-enter the world of Elsa, Anna, Kristoff, and Olaf. Ah, uh, yes, Olaf, that wonderful snowman. Now I'm clear on what we're talking about. There's a portion of the movie where Anna is desperate for a way out of all the chaos and turmoil that's been engulfing her, and she asks Olaf if he can see a silver lining or a bright side. So Olaf offers a humorous antidote. Did you know that turtles can breathe through their butts? As an aside, this reminds me of how my husband often manages difficult times by making a joke at an inopportune time by trying to lessen the tension. But regardless, Maddie wants to know if it's true. Can turtles really breathe through their butts? Now, my initial reaction is no. From what I know about anatomy and physiology, breathing typically pl takes place in the upper respiratory portion of the body. However, before I laugh off Olaf's statement, I'm reminded of another statement that Olaf made earlier in the movie. Water has memory. Now, I had previously looked up this statement because it's essential to the plot line of Frozen 2 and because I personally was intrigued by the possibility of water having memory. In Frozen 2, water memory is defined as a capacity for water to retain a memory or form of substance which were previously dissolved in that water. In the movie, this is portrayed as an irrefutable fact. In the scientific community, it's debated. In theology, it's undeniable. So Olaf's statement about the turtles could be true based on my previous research. And lo and behold, turtles can breathe through their butts. The technical term is cloacal respiration, and it's a little more nuanced than just inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide. But regardless, Olaf is a little sage his wisdom often on point, even when it seems unbelievable. Now at this point you're wondering if we're ever going to talk about Jesus, Jesus' baptism, or God in any form or function. And don't worry, we are. But momentarily, first back to Olaf and water heavy memory. You may have caught on to a little sentence that I said just previously. In theology, water memory is undeniable. And that's the piece that I want to talk about today. The turtles are just a funny way of reminding us that what may seem impossible isn't always impossible, and that when things are incredibly chaotic, hope often shows up unexpectedly. Water has memory, at least from God's perspective, and it's crucial to why Jesus is baptized and what he is baptized into. 
and therefore what we are baptized into. From Genesis to Revelation, water arcs through the Bible, courses through the scriptures, shapes the landscapes of our sacred texts, and services again and again in the story of the people of God. Water has almost always been a sign of God's provision, God's providence, and God's care for those God has claimed. So by the time we reach the shores of the Jordan with Jesus today, we and all the people of God have already been swimming in the stories. God begins by forming the heavens and the earth from a formless void with, water, with the winds sweeping over the waters. A stream is placed in the middle of the Garden of Eden for the help, health of the people. <clears throat> Noah and his family and all animals are saved through water, although admittedly the saving of water is a bit catastrophic to much of the world, and God realizes just how powerful and dangerous water can be. Hagar receives a wellspring in her desperate wilderness. Moses strikes a rock so that water will spring forth for the saving of the people, and Moses split the Red Sea so God's people could pass. Jacob met Rachel by a well. The psalmists proclaim again and again that God will, that God will water our ways um, when we're thirsty and dry. Water has memory. And these examples are just a few from the First Testament. There are numerous holy water moments, which took place at the Jordan River where we find ourselves today. And the Jordan River functions as a threshold, linking the past, the present, and the future. This is the same river which was stopped so that the Ark of the Covenant could be carried to the other side. This is the same river that Elijah struck with his mantle so that he and Elisha could cross just before Elijah ascended to heaven amid blazing horses and fire. This is the same river where Naaman is healed by Elisha. This is the same river that King David crossed with all of Israel as he fights the Armenians. Water has memory. As Jesus wades into these storied waters, he is the recipient of all the graces that these waters hold. He is also covered with all the grit and grime of earth, the sweat and urine and blood and runoff of humanity courses through these waters. The waters that John pours over Jesus are imbued with layer upon layer of blessing and pain. Jesus steps into all that has been, all that is, and all that will be, beginning his ministry upon earth, covered in filth. Jesus' first public act was an act of radical solidarity. Instead of holding himself apart, instead of protecting his own purity, Jesus stepped into the same water we stand in and wedded his reputation and his destiny to ours. Water has memory. As I reflect on the past few days, I feel sadness, shame, horror, and fear. We are a flawed and humiliated nation, and like many of you, my heart breaks. It's almost unbelievable that my heart can keep on breaking, as I feel it's been broken so many times over the past years. But somehow it's breaking again. Somehow my soul has been crushed again. Somehow, here we are, bleeding out again. There were and are many things that infuriated and alarmed me about the actions which occurred on the Feast of the Epiphany. But what sent a dagger through my heart were the Jesus flags, the Jesus tattoos, the In God We Trust banners, the cross necklaces, the large wooden crosses, signs that said, God, guns, and guts and Jesus saves. And all I could think was, don't bring Jesus into this mess. I don't know the Jesus that they paraded and waved around in the nation's capital. Maybe they're acting in the name of some other Jesus, but that's not the Jesus I meet in the Gospels. God did not send his beloved son into our world as a convenient scapegoat for us, to use him as, a, as an excuse for our immorality. Rather, Jesus' baptism was his commitment to engage with the evil of the world 
no matter how it rises up. And I guess that's why he dashes off into the wilderness, still dripping wet. He knows evil is lurking in plain sight, and he doesn't have a minute to lose. But here's the thing. <clears throat> I think there's always a thing when I preach. <clears throat> Jesus is already in this mess. Not in the way that those who sought to bring chaos into the world purport, but Jesus is in it. Jesus chose to step into those muddy waters so many years ago, and in doing so, he stepped into the story and mess of every person that has ever walked the earth. Now, he is likely up to his eyeballs in sewage and filth right now, and potentially wondering why the world is so bent on dissolving into hell, but he's not going to let us drown. That's the promise of baptism. When Jesus stepped into those waters, he went all in. And not only does he go all in, but he brings with him all that was and all that is and all that will be. He brings with him Adam and Eve and Rachel and Jacob and Moses and Elijah and Hagar and Ishmael and Naaman and Elisha, their storied lives and many others, inhabit those blessed wild waters of Jesus' baptism, which are used for the healing of the nations and peoples. Because water has memory. In baptism, God rains down waters of faithfulness, promises of cleansing and forgiveness, the defeat of hell, and the dawn of tomorrow upon the chaos of the earth. So yeah, Jesus was there on January 6th but not in a flag or in a symbolic cross or in the violent chants. But Jesus was there solely because he has promised to always be with us. He came for such a time as this, to see us through to a new day, to die with us and to raise us up. May this ever be true. Now, honestly, it has been hard for me to keep finding the good news, to keep holding out hope, to keep shining a light. But I've been as faithful as I can be, not only because it's part of my calling, but because it's essential to my faith. I don't have the best, most eloquent words right now, but this is what I do know. It is a serious thing to be alive today, to, to be baptized into the waters with Jesus, to be baptized into this fragile, broken world. Jesus knew this, and I think we all know this to be true today in a brand new way. At times such as these, we live into our baptismal calling to proclaim the good news of God in Christ Jesus through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace on earth. These are the days of rebirth, renewal, and resurrection. And I pray that it explodes all around us like spring in every living thing. Because that's what Jesus' baptism grants us. Water has memory, but more importantly, water has promise. <laughs>